everyone. Thanks for joining us today online at Buckhead Church. My name is Beth and I am our high school pastor. My name is Bo and we're so glad you decided to join us today. We're going to get to sing together. We're going to get to hear from Clay in the final part of his series and the hits just keep on coming. But first, there's a few things we want you to know about happening here at Buckhead Church. Yes. And the first thing that we want you to know is that at Buckhead Church, we are for you. And we know that this past year has felt isolating, discouraging, or just flat out hard. But we believe that finding a way to serve others through volunteering is one of the most meaningful things that you and I can do with our time. And it is such a practical way to be for our city. Yeah, around here, there are really hundreds of opportunities where you can volunteer and you can volunteer right now. In fact, you could get involved serving with students. You may not know this, but several months ago, we decided that during COVID, we would prioritize this building for our students. So middle and high school students have been gathering right here on Sunday mornings. If you miss being together, we miss being together too, but rest assured, life change is happening and it's happening right here in our auditorium and you could participate. That's right, and I may be a little biased towards serving with students, but there are also tons of other opportunities where you can volunteer at our church or in our city. And some are even digital opportunities, so you can make a difference right from where you are. You can visit buckheadchurch.org slash volunteer to check out the different ways that you can get involved. We also would love for you to mark your calendar for March 11th because at 7.30, we have a night of vision and worship together. We're gonna get to hear from Clay. We're gonna get to sing together. This is gonna be a digital experience with a limited in-person RSVP. We wanna make sure everybody is able to experience this event safely, whether that's in person or online. Yeah, and registration for this event will open soon. You can find out more info or join our mailing list by going to buckheadchurch.org. Yeah, if it's your first time here, we are so glad that you're here. We hope that today you know that we are for you. In fact, we'd love to send you a free gift on us. Just go to buckheadchurch.org slash new and let us know that you're here. That's it for Beth and I. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's sing together.
It's wild to think that we are writing history right now, that we're living in a season of life that's going to be written about in history books. And every one of us has our own story to tell of how this season has been challenging and difficult and brought about so many different moments that make us feel like the hits just keep on coming because there's not a real clear end in sight. There's not this 
magical moment when everything's going to change, when everything's going to be different. The, the hope that all of us have is that there is the other side. But what I found myself longing for, hoping for, believing in is that when we get to the other side, that it's going to be better. But we don't know that it's going to be better. Of course, we hope it's going to be better, but we don't know how it's going to be better. We don't know when it's going to be here, and we don't know what it's going to look like on the other side. And so my hope in this series, my hope for me, my hope for all of us is that God would maybe birth in us or maybe even help us develop a a pandemic-proof faith, a faith that's able to make it through anything, a faith that is strong enough to make it through whatever the next challenge is around the corner or over the hill, a, a faith that is impervious to any challenge that we could ever face. And this is becoming more and more difficult. As the world is changing, this is becoming more challenging. Because of some significant shifts that have happened over time, we are moving to a place where we need each other less. We're having to do this alone more than we've ever had to do it alone before. Let let, let me introduce to you a, a couple of these revolutions, and these probably won't be new to you, but I wanna just make one simple point after we look at these three. The first revolution is this, that there's been a revolution of, of wealth over the last thousand years. There's been a revolution where we've moved from uh, land being the primary commodity to money being the primary commodity. Uh, 700 BC or so was the first society to use money as currency. But before then, and, and even for many years after then, land was used. Natural resources, grain, oil, animals were used as trade, that you would build wealth as you owned land, as you gained resources. And this shift that we've made to money being the primary commodity, we've done so, and now we don't have to interact with each other. We don't have to interact with each other as we exchange money. The the second big revolution is this, that there's been a revolution of work. We've moved from humans to machines. This is known as the industrial revolution, right? That human strength was was how work was done until the steam engine, until we invented machines that replaced human labor. And it brought about so many drastic changes and it also was catalytic in the way societies began to change. But nothing has changed our society like this revolution, the revolution of of knowledge as we've moved from wisdom to information. Yeah, this computer revolution has changed everything. That in the past, wisdom was passed to us from previous generations or because we studied it in school or because we took a class or because we read it from books. And now because of the computation revolution, Information is being processed and created and transferred at such radical speeds that it's hard, it's impossible to even keep up with it. If you've been around kids lately, you've seen the impact of this. It's wild to think about how kids don't even need adults anymore. Kids don't have to learn something in a class. Kids don't have to read the entire the entire catalog of Encyclopedia Britannica that we all had in our parents' homes maybe, they they don't have to study that or read that or understand that because everything that you would want to know is at your fingertips. These, These shifts, these revolutions have brought about unprecedented prosperity that every one of us has benefited in some way from it. There's a greater overall health, people are living longer. There's greater wealth, people have accumulated more stuff, but but there is a caution. It's come to us at a cost. A cost to what? Relationship. Each other. That these three revolutions have led to a significant shift away from relationship. That we've moved from needing each other to not even having to interact with each other. See, money is so much less personal. Machines, machines don't have feelings. Everything that you would want to know is just a Google search away. Where, where is Tom Petty from? 
I, I, I don't know. Just Google it. You can figure it out on your own. See, we're moving to a, we're moving to a time in life where I, I don't have to know you and you don't have to know me. I don't have to need you and you don't have to need me. This is this has created a, a new epidemic in our world called loneliness. This is one of the greatest challenges of our day. And this is so difficult to figure out and understand because you can be around people all day long and be lonely. Or you can live alone and not be lonely. You can have all the Facebook friends in the world and yet still feel isolated. And, and the health challenges that come with loneliness, researchers are telling us that they're so significant. In fact, they, they tried to compare it. They said, if you wanna know what it's like, it's equivalent to someone smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's how significant the impact of loneliness is on our general health. But before we go any further with this, before you maybe think, oh, okay, I see where this is going. I understand what, what we're gonna be talking about. But the answer is not, we need more friends. The answer is not more relationships. No, it's way more than that. As, as we've said in this series, God, God uses trials and tragedy and suffering and hard times to do something significant, to, to loosen the grip that we have on the things that were never meant to satisfy us. There's nothing wrong with wealth. There's nothing wrong with health. There's nothing wrong with relationships. But through this last season, every one of us has learned in different ways. Oh, putting my hope in that, putting my hope in this, it isn't fulfilling. It, it, it doesn't actually give me what I want. No, with, with, without people, without having people in our corner who can help us figure out what to put back in our hands, once we're on the other side, we're, we're, we're sunk, we're lost. We, we've wasted this season. And, and, and when the hits won't stop, relationships that ground us are essential. Relationships that ground us, relationships that help us to fasten our feet in a faith that can make it through anything. Relationships that help remind us of what's most important in this life and in the next. And the apostle Paul had this in spades. If I can just remind you for a second where, where we've been, we've been in the middle of this one narrative, this one particular night in Paul's life. Paul is the pioneer of the local church, went around the Mediterranean rim starting churches. And this one particular season of his life. He's walking through this town. He's got his friend Silas there with him. There's this young girl that's following them. That's, she's got this gift. She's got a, a spirit in her that has the ability to predict the future. And she's yelling out, these men are, they're, they're men of the most high. These are servants of the most high. And they get irritated with her because she does this for days and she's blowing their cover and she's also just annoying them. And so Paul turns around finally and says, stop in the name of Jesus, I'm telling you, get out of her. And so she experiences freedom, but the, the men that were earning an income off of her gift experience loss. And so they had Paul and Silas arrested, beaten, flogged, jailed, and at midnight, they're found singing hymns to God and praying. And as if it wasn't bad already, an earthquake shakes the foundations of the prison and the doors to the cell fling wide open and the chains that are on their arms break free and the, the, the shackles that had fastened their feet to the ground were now broken all over the ground. Paul and Silas have this amazing interaction with this jailer who's realized because of these circumstances that are outside of his control that he no longer was able to do what he had been tasked to do. These men are now free. He knew I'm now in trouble. And so he starts to kill himself when Paul and Silas said, no, 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 no. We're not going anywhere. And they show him grace and they show him mercy in such a beautiful way that reminds us all that even when we can't see what God's up to, that he's doing something right in the middle of our pain. 
And his, his family ends up experiencing the same grace and the same mercy. The ripple of what Paul and Silas had done was reverberating beyond just him into his whole household. And here we are on the next day. The jailer returns Paul and Silas to prison. They graciously go with him back to prison. Acts 16, verse 35, that's where we pick it up. When when it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. They've served their time. They've been beaten, they've been flogged, they've been jailed. You can release them now. Plus, we've got to put the jail back together. I would assume was part of it as well. And so the jailer goes and tells Paul, he says, hey, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Good news, now you can leave, go in peace. But Paul was not having it. Paul was frustrated, he was angry, he was upset. He knew that what they did was wrong. He knew that they weren't given a fair trial. He knew that he was a Roman citizen, that Silas was a Roman citizen, and they didn't have the right to do what they had done. And so Paul, verse 37, Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and they threw us into prison. And now do they wanna get rid of us quietly? This is one of those moments in life if you had these, you know, where you go, yeah, no. Like that's not what's gonna happen here. I mean, this is the moment where, You tell your friends, yeah, and then I said this, and everybody's like, you did not say that. And Paul's like, no, that's exactly what I said. And Silas is like, no, he did. That's exactly what he said. It's his, I'd like to speak to the manager kind of moment, you know, where you kind of whisper to your friends like, hey, it's about to get bananas in here. You're gonna wanna watch. Like that's what's about to go down. And even though they were right, if I were there, I probably would have been like, you know what, Paul and Silas, now might not be the best time for this. You've already been through a lot of drama. Let's just end this thing quietly and let's get out of here. But Paul says, no, let let them come themselves and escort us out. (laughs) This is major attitude. And honestly, I'm here for all of it. I mean, the boldness of Paul to say, hey, I don't care what's just happened to us. What you did was wrong. And I wanna prove to everyone that what you did shouldn't have been done. Have you had a season recently that required a lot of boldness? Have you had a season where you had to muster up a lot of courage? Maybe it was a conversation that you didn't want to have and you talked yourself into it and it took a lot out of you emotionally. I I would guess that's what this was. And so just think about it. Now, on top of everything else that they had gone through, can you even imagine how exhausted they are? A little sassy? Yeah. Yeah but just exhausted. So the officers, they reported this to the magistrates. And when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they said, "Uh uh-oh, they were alarmed. And so they came themselves, and I assume this didn't just normally happen. They came themselves to appease them and escorted them from the prison. They probably had a gift basket with them. So sorry for your troubles take this and go on your way. We hope to never hear from you soon. And they requested that they leave the city. And it seems like that's the end of it. I mean, it's it's gone from tragic to even more tragic to miraculous to Paul, Silas, you're getting what you wanted. I mean, what What do you imagine that they were feeling in this moment? What what do you think they needed in this moment? My guess is they still had the effects of physical pain. My guess is that their faith had to be shook. I mean, just the crisis alone had to have done something to them. They probably needed some encouragement. Maybe they just needed to laugh celebrate, blow off some steam. And I want to look just, I want to look at what they did. I want to look at the first place they went. They went to the place where they could find all of that. Verse 40, after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house 
Now, what do we know about Lydia? Lydia, if we were to read the whole chapter of Acts 16, we, we, would, have, we would have learned about Lydia's conversion. Lydia is known as uh, a seller of purple. Uh, purple was an exotic color. It was, it was a sign of wealth and she dealt purple. She was a dealer. She was a purple dealer and she was incredibly wealthy. She was a, a, of, of the, the highest class and she had come to realize that Jesus' death on the cross paid for her sin and his resurrection gave her life beyond anything that her wealth could give. And she knew hospitality. She probably had a nice house. She probably was rocking a crib that could fit some people in it. And she had that early zeal. Do you remember some of you, some of you maybe have that now. Some of you can remember that season of your life where you were just so excited about your new found faith. That's where Lydia was. But she wasn't alone there. No, all of the crew was gathered there as well. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and the sisters and they encouraged them. Now, this isn't brothers and sisters, meaning relatives, but this is brothers and sisters, meaning we've been through life together. I mean, we've done some significant things. We've experienced the highest of highs and we've experienced some really low times. There is a bond that connects us that's deeper than family. There's a faith that connects us that's beyond what what we could even explain. They went to Lydia's house to meet with the people that grounded them, to take care of their wounds, to have a meal together, to be encouraged by them, I assume, and then to encourage them as well. And then the, the chapter just ends with these three words. Then they left. They just moved on. Then it was on to the next one. They, they had a mission on their life. They were not going to slow down because of a hard time, but they had been replenished. They had been refueled. They had been taken care of, and now they're ready to move back out into the world to accomplish the mission that God had put right there in their life. I don't want to rush past, as simple as this little verse is, I don't want to rush past this idea of these brothers and these sisters because in the case of Acts 16, they're nameless. They're clearly faceless, but they weren't to Paul and they weren't to Silas. In fact, in Paul's case, there's a chapter at the end of his letter that he wrote to those Christians that were scattered all throughout Rome. It's known as his letter to the Romans. And it's one of the most weighty theological essays, pieces, works that, that, that anyone has seen or read, certainly that Paul had written. And at the very end of this letter, after dropping all of this weighty, heavy, lofty theology of who God is and what this means for us and understanding our sin and understanding this new life that we have in Jesus, he spends an entire chapter, all of Romans 16, putting names to the brothers and to the sisters. And, and honestly, just to honor this incredible story and also to let us know of how important these people are in our, in our lives, uh, I wanna just read Romans 16 to you because he actually gives us 29 names, 29 different people that had been through life with him, that had helped him, that he had helped, that had done something significant, 29 of these brothers and sisters. And so just hang with me if you would, but I, I wanna read these names. I'm, we're gonna put these names up on the screen so that you can see them as well. Here's, here's what he wrote in Romans 16. He said, I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a servant in the church in Centuria. 
I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help that she may need from you. For she has been a great help to many people, including me. Would you greet Priscilla? Would you greet Aquila? My fellow workers in Christ Jesus, listen to this, they risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all of the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them as well. Greet also the church that meets in their house and greet my dear friend Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia and greet Mary who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles and they were in Christ even before I was. Would you greet Ampliatus, whom I love in the Lord? Would you greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, my dear friend Statius? Greet Apellus, tested and approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my relative. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, who's chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus and Phlegon and Hermes and Petrobus and Hermas and the brothers with them. Greet Philogus and Julia and Nereus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send their greeting. I'm telling you that these were Paul's people. I mean, these were the people that he could depend on. These were the people that had provided for him when he was in his deepest state of need. These were the people that he had helped. But when the hits wouldn't stop, these are the people that were on his mind. In fact, when he's writing Romans, he's in the middle of struggles then as well. We know because of what he wrote. And these were the people that he thought of. There, there's a military term that is used as a process to take stock, to take an assessment after someone's been through something as traumatic as a bomb. It's called a, a BDA, a bomb damage assessment. And what I would recommend for this year is for every single one of us to do that very same thing, that we've all had a significant bomb dropped in our own life. And it's looked it's come in so many different forms. It's looked so differently to every single one of us. Maybe for you, it's maybe you had a daughter who got married this year without a wedding. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you lost your income. Maybe you missed a graduation. Maybe you lost a loved one. Maybe you experienced loneliness like you've never experienced before. But would you do what Paul did in Romans 16? Would you do what Paul gave an example of for us as he goes to Lydia's house and meets with the brothers and the sisters to encourage them? Would you, would you make your own list? Would you list the people who help keep you grounded? Now, again, these aren't the people that have been in your life the longest. These might not be the people that you went to college with. These might not be the people that you work with, but these are the people that ground you. These are the people that help fasten your feet to the faith that can survive anything. These are the people that help you mourn the things that have been taken out of your hands. And these are the people that help you know when you're putting something back in your hand, is this, is this a good move or not? Would you make that list? I, I know some of you are listening to this and you're thinking, oh, okay, I, I, I kind of am thinking of the people. No, I'm, I'm telling you, would you write it down? There's something powerful about actually writing down their name. You don't have to get to 29. Paul did, but you don't have to. I'm just telling you, would you make a list of the people that help keep you grounded? And then would you do something that may seem a little odd, but would you tell them? Would you actually say it to them? Maybe text it to them, email it to them. I, I don't know, but would you say to them, hey, I just want to let you know, I was making a list of the people that I know that I can lean on that are gonna be there for me when the hits won't stop. And you are one of them. Why? Why tell them? Well, for a couple of different reasons. Number one, because you might just wanna thank them. You might just wanna say, thank you for being that to me in the past. 
But secondly, it provides a certain amount of accountability to say, hey, I'm gonna need you in the future and I wanna be there for you as well. And then thirdly, would you make yourself available to them? I, I, I know life is busy. I know this is not one of those things that's urgent, even though it is important. And I know life has slowed down in a sense, but the pace is already picking back up. And before we know it, I would imagine that we're gonna be right back into that cycle of busyness. And if somebody were to come and stop and say to you, hey, do you have those people? Have you made the list? You might be able to say, yeah. Have you told them that? Yeah. But are you at a place where you're available to them? I would imagine for a lot of us, we're just too busy. So I don't know what it looks like for you to make yourself available to them, but maybe it means setting up something on a regular basis. Maybe it means some kind of form of, of, of letting each other know what's happening, some, some kind of deep sense of vulnerability, letting them know 100% what's happening in your life. But would you write it down? Would you tell them about it? And then would you make yourself available to them. I, I need you and I want to be there for you. And, and to those that maybe you're thinking, well, I don't even know where to start. I, I, I just don't have these kinds of relationships in my life. I just want to encourage you. I, 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 want, to, I want to just point out this simple truth that this is what the church is. In fact, the beauty of the church is that there's always a community waiting for you. There are people that need you. There are people that need your story. There are people that need to know what you've been through. There are people that need to know how you've dealt with it. In the same way that you need those people as well. This is, this is God's plan to keep us connected to each other. Sure, there's other ways. But his plan A is the church. And I know for some of you, maybe you're thinking, well, if you knew my story, you'd know why this is hard for me. Maybe you have a story where someone in the church has let you down, or maybe this is even why you put your faith down and walked away. I would just beg you, would you give the church another shot? I don't mean give the building another shot. I mean, would you give the community of people another shot? See, when, when the hits won't stop, when we're in one of those seasons again, where it just feels never ending, another one, and then another one, having those people in our life that ground us, it is so essential. And it's what the church aims to be. And it's what I hope for you. And it's what I hope for me as well. So in light of that, I would love to just pray for us. Heavenly Father, I know that for a lot of people, this is just, uh, this is just a reminder. It's like, a, oh yeah, 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 that, that, I, I, need to, I, need to, I need to write it down. I, I should tell them and I need to be more available. But God, for others, this is, uh, this is painful. This is challenging. It's difficult because of scars from the past or maybe because of a lack of trust that they have with other people or because of how they've been burned. And I just ask you, would you help them to find a sense of grace? The kind of grace that Paul had, the kind of grace that others had for Paul. Maybe to forgive, maybe to move on, maybe to give it another shot. Because God, I don't know how I do not know how you get through a season like this without having brothers and sisters in faith that can fasten our feet to what is most true. And so we ask you for this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.